Hello, everyone. I'm Martin Jean. I'm director of the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. We're an interdisciplinary graduate center at Yale dedicated to the study and practice of sacred music, worship, and the arts. And we're continuing our series of Zoom interviews in our socially distant uh, respective places. And once again, I'm joined by my colleague, the redoubtable Professor Teresa Berger. Hello, Teresa. Hello. Hello to you. Uh, just a reminder that Professor Berger is uh, prof uh, the Thomas E. Golden Professor of Liturgical Studies and Catholic Theology at Yale Divinity School and the Institute of Sacred Music, and she is the author of the book At Worship, Liturgical Practices in Digital Worlds, Routledge Press. Great to uh, see you there in your uh, study or dining room, I can't quite tell, but it's, it's good to see you, even though we can't be in the same, uh, same room. So, Teresa, when we spoke, it was two weeks ago, right? And it was at a time when the whole procedure of shelter in place was new to many of us. And it seemed, you know, it might be, might take a couple of weeks or maybe a month at most, but, uh, but you know, we'd be all together soon and back in our churches and houses of worship, worshiping side by side. Some people thought we might even be open for business on Easter day. <laughs> But I think, uh, sad to say, that's not happening. And we're uh, sheltering in place for quite some time uh, due to this uh, pandemic. Um, so since then, just in the last two weeks, there has been an explosion of worship experiences springing up in digital spaces for the simple fact that we're just not able to be together physically in the same space. And I'm... I've been thinking about this a lot. I know you have too. So, Teresa, what are we to learn from this kind of proliferation of worship practices online? First, I think everybody who follows this trend um, has to notice um, how creative and actively present the various faith communities and not only Christian ones are seeking to be for their faithful. And this really uh, stretches across a gamut of possibilities and different media platforms. So that's the first thing simply to acknowledge um, the vast energies, the imagination, the, the experimentation, the improvisation that has gone into this incredible surge of uh, materials for prayer and worship, devotion, meditation um, that is now uh, digitally mediated and we're we're aware this is really a global phenomenon isn't this isn't just located in the u.s but all over the world in virtually every faith tradition yes that said there continues to be a marked digital divide mm. across the globe and across faith traditions between those who have easy access to digital media and and those who don't and that will continue to be uh, with us. Um, I have secondly been very intrigued by some of the pastoral experimentations in cases of emergency that have arisen. So it's one thing to throw a nicely put together morning prayer on your YouTube channel. It's, I think, a different uh, problem to think through how to minister to those who are dying uh, and maybe the, uh, offer the sacrament of anointing or something that requires physical touch when someone is in, in um, isolation, in physical isolation. Um, 
and there have been some stretchings of the sacramental imagination that have opened up um, unusual pathways. Let's, let's put it like that. Um, the third thing that I've been struck by is how people um, now on the receiving end of um, digitally mediated ritual practices who might in an earlier age, let's say three weeks ago, um, have been suspicious of digitally mediated ritual practices are discovering um, it, its possibilities. I read about a woman today um, who attended a funeral in digital mediation because she couldn't uh, travel and found that for the first time in her life, she could openly cry her heart out in a funeral when before she always felt constrained in a public space and not to do that so that others wouldn't fall apart. And I thought to myself, yes, that is something that in some uses of digital media could be um, opened up, that there are spaces of freedom also uh, that offline didn't provide. So it's a it's quite mixed bag. It it uh, it brings uh, possibilities to a, a, a sense of private devotion that uh, yeah maybe you feel hindered uh, by. It also occurs to me that uh, uh, you, you you speak of marked differences or differences in populations, but differences in practices too. My own Protestant uh, traditions are are so heavily uh, weighted toward uh, the verbal, toward word, toward text and not so much toward physicality or the materiality of worship. And I know you're as a Roman Catholic uh, uh, and uh, the, the, sacri the, the, the uh, sensibilities toward the physical and material in terms of sacramental theology are, um, are uh, robust in Catholicism. Yeah, the word-centered um, Christian traditions always had it easier in a sense with digital mediation. <laughs> The first church in cyberspace, and if I remember correctly, it opened in the late 1990s. It was um, a, a church out of the Calvinist tradition, and basically for it, what church in cyberspace meant was uh, putting the pastor's sermons online. Wow. <laughs> for a Catholic, that wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't quite cut the mustard. So do you, do, you, do you think that we can even talk anymore about real worship versus digital worship? Is that even a, a divide that we should hold? I think that's an older age of theorizing that created that or lived with that uh, dichotomy. It's basically gone on the dust heap, yeah. in, especially in the last few weeks with people experimenting, um, way encountering divine presence in digital mediation. Now, at the same time, you asked me about what might have uh, come up in the last two weeks in terms of this surge of online practices of worship. I don't think I'm the only one who is getting circuit overload in terms of digitally mediated practices of worship. And it's probably in part, not only because there is a deluge of such practices, but because it's now embedded in us having to spend so much time online. We work from home, uh, you know, the gamut of uh, everything that now has to happen online. So, Add to that a deluge of prayer practices where I could start at seven in the morning with a, a mass that Pope Francis presides at in the Vatican to um, a morning prayer through on my prayer app to daily prayer for Mark One Chapel at YDS. To, I could spend 
my whole day in, with digitally mediated prayer. And at some point I had to say to myself, you know what? I'm just going to go into my garden and into silence mm. and seek to encounter God in that way. Mm. You would think with all of this supposed solitude that uh, shelter in place affords us potentially, unless we have small kids at home, then, uh, uh, you know, even in that context, many of us still manage to fill the silence with fit with stuff. Yes, and with so much content now being thrown online, mm. it's not become easier. Mm. It, it proves the, that the discipline of keeping silence is just that. It's a discipline and takes work, it takes effort, it takes intentionality uh, to accomplish. Do you, do you think we, we learn other lessons from this proliferation just in terms of, of um, what, what, it, what it means to be together in a space of time as opposed to a geographical or physical space? I think something that digital media theorists have said for a while now, namely that in digital mediation and the way faith communities gather digitally, simultaneity, in other words, being in a digital social space at the same time, uh, begins to rise in importance over and against physical co-presence, mm. location in one brick and mortar sanctuary. Yeah. I think we are seeing that enacted uh, <laughs> in many ways, not only in our faith communities, but in other ways of congregating in digital social space. Yeah. And different, different houses of worship are, are um, realizing these in, in these uh, opportunities in different ways, right? So some will pre-record a uh, worship much as they might have done for a televised uh, service, but others are actually inviting people to join via one of these uh, conference calling kind of softwares at the same time. My, a church that I know very well in Chicago does this and the the worship in many ways operates it at the in the same way as it did on other Sundays before shelter in place as it does digitally mediated so the the leadership roles are um, are demarcated people have uh, their their role in worship they contribute their gifts they bring forward both textually musically in offering and prayers and it's done <laughs> it's a it's an amazingly, deeply meaningful uh, experience, I find myself when I, when I join them. Yeah. The other interesting thing that a colleague of mine, uh, who also works at the intersection of digital media and liturgy pointed out, and I think he's right, is that many churches who now have various, offer various forms of worship in digital mediation, whatever the platform is, are noticing that it's a low entrance space. So people actually wander in who may never dare to open an actual church door. Mm -hmm. That's too scary. Yeah, yeah. But online you suddenly get visitors <laughs> who are only a click away from your community. Yeah. And um, it's, that's an interesting uh, moment also. So, again, digital media theorists of, who study online churches have said that in many cases they've witnessed anonymity um, actually producing forms of intimacy. Hmm. That suddenly you are able to say, because you can hide, I did this horrible thing. I carry it with me. I don't know what to do with it. 
and it, it's really an intriguing, um, uh, not development, but an intriguing phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, we'd be foolish to think that there are not gifts and blessings realized by, by the circumstances we're, we're in. Um, what you've just uh, mentioned, one, the, the fact of, that there's a sense of freedom in a kind of anonymity that this, uh, this mediation allows. At the same time, we have to realize, I have to realize that I, I feel lost at the same time. I know that Palm Sunday is this coming Sunday as we're making this recording and all, all next week, you know, a year ago, churches would have been singing my favorite hymns and there's just <laughs> nothing that can substitute for me being in the same room, in the same acoustical space, surrounded by people moving the molecules of air on my eardrum, singing these hymns that I've sung since I was a little boy, right? So the losses and, uh, and gifts uh, at the same time. I think for Christians and other people of faith who turn in their prayer and worship towards a divine presence, mm -hmm. the comforting element in all of this, at least for me, is that God isn't, doesn't find digital mediation any more problematic than the air of my, the sanctuary in which I worship. Yeah. And ultimately, if Christian worship is not just a holy rotary club, but church turned towards divine presence. Um, and if we can keep our um, eyes on that, I would say, you know, whatever it takes for us to gesture towards that divine presence. And at this point, we cannot do it in physical community. But the encounter with the divine isn't, um, isn't exclusive to uh, offline uh, brick and mortar sanctuaries. It, it, it can be mediated to any, any reality. And for me personally, that is a theological truth that I'm happy to accept and uphold. And I thank you for it. So, uh, Teresa, thank you very much for this time. And uh, to all of our listeners out there, I'm happy to refer you to others of these kinds of makeshift Zoom-inspired uh, encounters online. Uh, you'll be seeing other instantiations of these in the, in the weeks to come. And uh, in general, I hope uh, that you will check out our website, ism.el.edu, and our various social media presences, where we uh, share as many gifts as we can uh, like uh, the gift of my beloved colleague, Teresa Berger, here today. Thank you again, Teresa. Thank you. Be well, everybody. Yeah, good health to everyone. Be very careful and, uh, um, and very uh, blessed Holy Week for those who are approaching those practices. Thank you. Bye-bye.